What are the Allies? Did they give a pass on the speed craze? Well, no, they didn't. They were all about the math just as much as the Axis. Yes, no matter what side you were on, your great-grandpappy likely spent at least some of his time during the war hopped up on drugs. As early as 1940, the British Armed Forces discovered tubes of pervitin in the bailout kits of downed German craft and sought to investigate the benefits of stimulant drugs. The focus of their research, however, would not be meth, but amphetamine, marketed as benzodrine. Studies were conducted by Dr. Roland Winfield and Dr. Frederick Bartlett on RAF crews, all of which produced mixed results. Winfield's studies initially compared the effectiveness of amphetamine versus methamphetamine in air crews. He found that both boosted attention and morale, although they could also make pilots reckless and aggressive, which did not bode well for the crew's safety. What gave benzodrine the edge over pervitin was the subjective evaluation of the crews themselves who reported that the former gave them a marked feeling of well-being. Winfield then pitched Benzedrine against placebo in a real battlefield environment. Bomber crews demonstrated an increased determination in circumstances of acute anxiety. Winfield cited two examples in which bomber pilots coolly and recklessly dodged anti-aircraft fire over the skies of Cologne and Paris to then plunge at extremely low altitudes and score direct hits over ammunition factories. Dr. Barlett, on the other hand, conducted tests in a more controlled environment during flight simulator sessions. His aim was to compare the effects of benzodrine and caffeine on pilots' performance. Barlett found that the stimulant did not improve pilots' performance, but simply prevented it from deteriorating. The pilots, however, reported preferring the effects of amphetamine over caffeine, although some complained about a distorted perception of time and about feeling lustful. The doctor's final recommendation was for RAF leadership to issue a limited supply of benzodrine. Pilots were advised to take no more than two 5mg tablets before a long mission, but even so, a medical officer had to issue a prescription. The problem was, the RAF was short on medical personnel. Hence, pilots took to self-prescribing the wakey-wakey pills, as they called them. A pilot at the 115 Squadron would require called that there wasn't a wakey-wakey philosophy, you just took one if you were sleepy. The lack of philosophy led to the usual cases of abuse and side effects, which we have already described for Pervitin. Dr. Frederick Bartlett recommended a controlled use of Benzedrine also to Royal Navy crews. In this case, once again, medical officers were to dispense no more than 10 milligrams of the drug per sailor over a period of 24 hours. But also, in this case, lack of medical manpower led to widespread abuse with crews on long oceanic missions popping pills out of boredom. The RAF and Royal Navy used between 50 and 60 million benzedrine tablets in total during the war, a consumption which was dwarfed by the Army's order of 72 million pills. The biggest fan amongst British senior officers was Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery, who organized his own experiments in August 1942. Two infantry squads, one on benzedrine, one on a placebo, had to compete over a period of 56 straight hours. Their trials included rifle shooting, trench digging, code signaling, machine gun assembly, and a seven-mile march. According to Professor Nick Nicholas Rasmussen at the University of New South Wales, Australia, quote, Not only did the Benzedrine squad win by 11 minutes in the latter study and report feeling more energy and clearer thinking, they also displayed a snap and zest conspicuously absent in the placebo squad. And snap and zest is exactly what Monty needed to defeat his rival Erwin Rommel in North Africa, and thus he ordered large quantities of Benzedrine before his offensive at Al Alamein. The Commonwealth and Free French forces decisively pushed back, the Italo-German defenders prompting Montgomery to issue standard orders on the rather heavy use of Benzedrine, 20 mg per day for as many as five days straight. The experiments conducted amongst pilots, sailors, and Montgomery's troops, however, lacked rigor and good reporting standards, as summarized by Professor Rasmussen, Quantifiable objective advantages for physical and psychomotor performance, perception and hand-eye coordination, remained unproven despite thorough testing by experts in England. Over in the US, initial research on the military use of Benzedrine was helmed by Dr. Andrew Conway Ivey, president of the American Physiological Society. Initially, Dr. Ivey, not a fan of the stuff. Existing studies suggested that amphetamine could improve wakefulness and mood, but they could not consistently demonstrate improved mental psychomotor performance. Caffeine could provide the same benefits as Benzedrine without the side effects. Nonetheless, Ivy sought to carry out his own research, testing uppers on Army Air Force pilots. The test subjects were divided into five groups, each receiving a different stimulant – caffeine, amphetamine, methamphetamine, ephedrine, or adrenal steroids. They then had to enter a decompression chamber and perform a series of visual, psychological, physiological, and coordination tests at progressively higher simulated altitudes. The studies were concluded by July 1942, with Dr. Ivy reaching some perplexing conclusions. He found that pilots appeared to feel better with amphetamines at high altitudes, but otherwise benzedrine did not outperform caffeine. Logically, a doctor may have chosen to recommend caffeine being the stimulant with fewer side effects, right? 
right? Well, to quote from Professor Rasmussen again, somehow the burden of proof had shifted by July 1942 and for reasons not specified. Now, Ivy argued since his data showed that amphetamine was no worse than caffeine, benzedrine could be taken by aviators for its waking effect without fear of impairing performance or judgment, regardless of the fact that no tests of the drug's effects on judgment were reported. According to Rasmussen, Ivy's decision may have been influenced by his concurrent tests on ground troops, which showed that benzedrine heightened morale. It appears that Ivy's test subjects asked the doctor if they could have more tablets for their weekend leave. In a parallel to Dr. Ivy's research, the branches of the U.S. military had been conducting their own studies. The first tests were carried out as early as December 1941 by the Army Air Force and showed that benzedrine could improve the vision of tired air crews. Subsequent studies up to October 1942 indicated that the use of amphetamine could prevent the decline of pilots' performance over time. Not an exciting result, but the study recommended that benzedrine should be given to bomber pilots returning from long-range missions. By February 1943, the military had taken their decision. The Army Supply Service would order from manufacturers Smith, Klein, and French large quantities of benzedrine. More precisely, packets containing six 5mg tablets to be issued by commanding officers to individual soldiers. This decision allowed Smith, Klein, and French to feature the military in their new adverts, bearing the tagline, For men in combat, when the going gets tough. The Supply Service issued a memo to Generals Eisenhower and MacArthur, commanders of the North African and South West Pacific theaters, respectively. The memo recommended a supply of 100,000 packets per month, but Eisenhower immediately replied, asking for 500,000 packets. Already by June 1943, an internal survey revealed how U.S. troops routinely and liberally took amphetamines with little respect for official guidelines. Around the same period, the Navy and Marine Corps evaluated the impact of uppers, conducting a well-structured, placebo-controlled, double-blind study, probably the most rigorous trial described thus far. The main endpoint for the trial was marksmanship. Would Marines become better shots on amphetamines? The trial found no statistically significant superiority in the Benzedrine group when it came to hitting targets, but it did show a marked self-reported increase in morale. Marines on speed did not shoot better than their sober compatriots, but they were feeling fantastic. Sure, they also experienced hallucinations and impaired judgment, but I mean the soldiers were only highly trained individuals armed to the teeth, so what could go wrong? In the end, the morale boost was enough to convince the Corps' commanders to supply Benzedrine to their men just before the hard-fought battle for Tarawa Atoll in November 1943. All in all, across all services, an estimated 16 million U.S. military personnel were exposed to Benzedrine during the war, which just happened to be the same number as the number of soldiers. We're on to you, grab Pappy. Such precise numbers on the consumption of performance-enhancing drugs are not available for the Red Army, and we only have anecdotal reports of two substances being being used. The first one was 2,4-dinitrophenol, or DNP for short. During the Great War, this compound was used in the manufacture of ammunition and later as a dye, a wood preserver, and even a herbicide. In 1933, Stanford University researchers found that it could be used for human consumption as a weight loss drug. <laughs> How'd they find that out? Yo, yo, John! John, my post-grad student, come over here! <laughs> Eat this! But it carried a high risk of serious adverse events. Poor John. According to the Journal of Medical Toxicology, these included hypothermia, tachycardia, diaphoresis, and tachypnea, eventually leading to death by John. Little surprise, DNP was recalled in 1938. As for the hypothermia, Red Army medical officers actually occasionally prescribed it to frontline soldiers as a means to keep them warm. The problem was, much like when drinking alcohol, the soldiers only felt warmer while still exposed to the dangers of hypothermia and frostbite. But in this case, as with alcohol, they didn't fully realize it. Plus all the other lethal effects, of course. And I mean, what could go wrong with eating a dye? Especially tachycardia, or excessively high heart rate, which led to numerous deaths by heart attack. The second substance was musimol, a psychoactive molecule found in the mushroom Amanita muscaria. The mushroom was widely believed to induce a sort of fighting frenzy in the berserker Norse warriors, hence the phrase going berserk. However, the effects of Amanita are unpredictable, ranging from nausea and confusion to euphoria and relaxation, and the use of this mushroom was better documented among Siberian shamans as an aid to induce a trance-like state. 
Based on the precedent, Professor Lukasz Kamienski, Jagiellonian University in Krakow, Poland, claimed that Siberian troops, quote, were reportedly stoned on the mushroom at the Battle of Sikes Verbovar in Hungary in 1945. They performed equally fearlessly. All in all, it appears that all personnel serving with most major belligerents had access to some type of drug, often distributed by unit commanders with little consideration for the adverse events nor long-term effects. But after the capitulation of Germany on May the 8th, 1945, it became evident to local and occupation authorities how the use, or rather the abuse, of pervitin had greatly affected both military personnel and workers involved in the war effort. Long-term users suffered from cardiovascular problems, cognitive impairment, anxiety, paranoia, hallucinations, insomnia, exhaustion, and uncontrolled weight loss. Moreover, meth abuse could lead to social disintegration as psychological effects could impact the user's relationships with friends, family, and co-workers. The extent of meth addiction in the German population in the 50s and 60s has not been quantified, unlike the case of other powers, as we shall see later. Based on a 1992 study by sociologist Karl Heinz Ruband, University of Cologne, by the late 1960s, the West German government appeared to be more concerned by the widespread use of heroin and cannabis, enacting harsher legislation against drug trafficking in 1971. We do know, however, that pervitin was still widely used as of the late 1960s. Manufacturer Temmler, in fact, still supplied the armed forces of both East and West Germany. The latter removed the drug from their medical supplies only a decade later, while East Germany ceased its orders only in 1988. The impact of amphetamines on post-war populations was better documented in the US, UK, and Japan. In 1947, psychiatrists Russell Monroe and Hyman Drell published the findings of a study conducted at an American military prison, according to which 25% of imprisoned personnel were addicted to benzodrine, suffering from agitation and hallucinations. And out of those addicted soldiers, 27% had first received amphetamine while in active service. Professor Rasmussen's conclusion based on this data was that benzodrine abuse, although an existing practice, was multiplied many times by military exposure. During the 1950s, amphetamine consumption in the US continued to soar. According to the FDA, by 1962, the American market was flooded with an estimated 80,000 kilos of amphetamine, equivalent to 43 doses of 10 milligrams per person per year. According to the same period, data showed that amphetamine consumption was widespread also in the UK. A study conducted in and around Newcastle showed that 3% of all retail prescriptions were for benzodrine, and between 20 and 25% of the prescribed patients were addicted to the drug. Another study conducted by Dr. Philip Connell showed that all patients hooked on uppers were susceptible to developing psychosis and paranoia, with some patients reporting sinister voices emanating from toilet bowls or spies following one's every move. Throughout the 1960s, annual production of amphetamine in the US peaked at up to 10 billion pills. 20% of these tablets were prescribed by dietitians and weight loss clinics, while 50% were diverted to the illegal drugs trade for recreational use. As of 1970, almost a million known American amphetamine users met certain criteria of dependence, with one-third of them being full-blown addicts. The U.S. Congress took notice, issuing the Comprehensive Drug Abuse Prevention and Control Act, which sought to place restrictions on the production and distribution of amphetamines. In practical terms, however, restrictions were heavily enforced only on injectable formulations of mess, while oral amphetamine production declined by only 17%. By 1971, the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs, later known as the Drug Enforcement Administration, or DEA, took matters into their own hands, placing heavier restrictions on all amphetamine products. The immediate effect was an upshot of prescriptions as expected, but by 1972, numbers had plummeted by 60%. Japan faced a similar challenge in their post-war years. After 1945, the large military reserves of Philippon meth flooded the market, feeding the addiction developed by military personnel and factory workers. Part of the stockpiles were handed over to hospitals and pharmacies for medical use, and prescribed as antidepressants for the defeated and humiliated population. But the majority was diverted to the black market, where the Yakuza crime syndicates took over the profitable distribution business. Soon, Japanese authorities had to face a full-blown meth epidemic in the nation, which was also driven by the large presence of U.S. military bases. According to the newspaper Asahi Shinbun, U.S. servicemen were found distributing amphetamines from large cities into small towns. And in 1953, the Japanese police's narcotics section arrested 623 American soldiers for drug trafficking. The Japanese government had already been taking action in 1951, banning meth possession with the Stimulant Control Law. These measures resulted in an initial wave of 17,500 arrests, but seemed to do little to curb the use of speed. By 1954, arrests had risen to almost 56,000. 
In the same year, a survey conducted by the Ministry of Welfare revealed how 7.5% of the population, some 6.7 million individuals, had taken Philippon at some point. Eventually, the strict laws enacted by the government combined with the effects of economic growth succeeded in curbing meth abuse. Nonetheless, the stimulant would remain the most popular illegal drug in Japan for decades. Now, as we conclude our overview of the war on drugs, let's circle back to our initial question. Was Nazi leadership seeking to create meth-fueled armies of super soldiers? Methamphetamine consumption was widespread, certainly, and encouraged by commanders in the field for tactical purposes. But higher-ranking officers and Nazi party officials saw no strategic benefit in the stimulant drug and actually tried to regulate its use. By contrast, Japanese leadership seemed to be more eager to foster use of meth among military personnel and factory workers, depicting it as a patriotic duty. On the Allied side, Benzedrine enjoyed a similarly enthusiastic endorsement from top-ranking generals such as Eisenhower or Montgomery, with especially the latter happily superseding guidelines from medical officers. So, did the use of amphetamines actually make any difference? Now, stimulant drugs surely played a role in accomplishing short-term tactical victories on both sides of the conflict. Anecdotal evidence confirms their impact on heightening morale and on providing an energy boost in life and death situations. But more robust evidence than formal studies suggests that neither Pervitin nor Benzedrine improved skills such as problem-solving, decision-making, nor marksmanship. And in recommended doses, they only increased wakefulness by a narrow margin when compared to caffeine. Moreover, early assessments by medical officers flagged the seriousness of the side effects of amphetamines, which have nullified the positives of these drugs in the aggregate. All in all, it is not possible to isolate the impact of stimulant drugs on the individual battles or campaigns of World War II, nor on the overall outcome of the conflict. As in most symmetrical wars, the side with the strongest production capabilities and most reliable supply lines tends to win. The problem with World War II, well, one of the many problems with World War II, is that the production capabilities of the major world powers were enlisted into the war effort to supply millions of young soldiers and workers on both sides with addictive drugs with little knowledge nor consideration for the effects on post-war society, from mental health to birth defects to simply the consequences of making a bunch of individuals, often suffering from PTSD, addicts as well. Brilliant. And thank you for watching.